The hearing will come to order. Today the Senator, Senate is holding a hearing in this committee on one of the most indefensible disparities in our system of justice and the bipartisan legislation designed to eliminate it once and for all, the Equal Act. To start things off, I'd like to turn to a video about the history of this disparity and the racially disparate impact it's had. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. It is epidemic and it can kill. We must be intolerant of drug use and drug sellers. The crack problem has become a crack crisis and it's spreading nationwide. We must be intolerant of drugs not because we want to punish drug users, but because we care about them and want to help them. In 1996, I was sentenced to 35 years. This disparity caused my sentence to be increased for 20 years longer than it would have been had it been for powder cocaine. In 1995, I was sentenced to 20 years. My 11-year-old daughter was molested while I was in prison at 11 years old. My sister was barely 23 years old and a mother of three young children. Now, Eugenia had been sentenced for powder cocaine. Her sentence would have been less than half of the one she received. Why did we do that? Because we were frightened. It was a, a reaction. There was a misperception that crack cocaine was something different chemically than what powder cocaine was. It's only a mere frying pan and baking soda that stands between powder and crack. Congress created this disparity which was 100 to 1 between crack and powder cocaine sentences. President Obama signed the Fair Sentencing Act. It reduces the disparity in the amount of powder cocaine and crack cocaine required for a mandatory minimum sentence. The U.S. Sentencing Commission agreed to make retroactive changes in sentencing guidelines. Doesn't save lives, doesn't reduce crime, so what does it do that protects the status quo? And the status quo is white privilege. Eighty percent of crack defendants are African American, and they're twenty percent more likely to be sentenced. It's mostly small-time dealers who end up in jail. For every white crack dealer, there are ten black crack dealers prosecuted. We can't get rid of discrimination in every human heart, but we can take it out of the criminal code. This is not a weak on crime uh, initiative. You can still enhance their penalties. And so if it's violence associated with it, you're going to have tougher penalties, and that's what we have to concentrate our efforts on. President Obama signed a law that will close the long disputed gap in federal sentencing for crap versus powder cocaine, cutting the ratio to about 18 to 1. But that was a political compromise that no one thought finished the job. In November 1985, the New York Times ran a front page story warning of a, quote, new purified form of cocaine that had emerged on the streets of New York City. The article characterized the drug as the wave of the future and quoted a doctor who claimed that anyone who used it would be addicted almost instantaneously. Over the next year, thousands of articles and hours of breathless news coverage would be devoted to the dangers of crack cocaine. But much of this coverage was predicated on an outright falsehood, such as the notion that crack is more addictive than powder cocaine, or that it's more likely to make its users violent. Today, several decades removed from our mass panic over crack cocaine, we know that powder cocaine and crack are simply two forms of the same drug. Make no mistake. Both are addictive and dangerous, and once they reach the brain, they produce similar physiological and psychological effects. But while the scientific consensus on crack has evolved over the years, our nation's drug sentencing policy has not. At the height of the crack scare in 1986, facts fell victim to fear, and fear inspired, inspired misguided and discriminatory policy. In response to a nation in panic, we passed, on a bipartisan basis, a law that imposed a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine offenses, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. To, date, to this date, it is one of the worst votes I ever cast. That legislation derived from a war on drugs era mentality that we could somehow incarcerate our way out of a drug epidemic. That approach did not work with crack cocaine. In fact, it has never worked. In the 50 years since President Nixon declared our failed war on drugs, drug use and drug availability has increased. Our nation has endured a crack epidemic, a meth epidemic, and currently an opioid epidemic. 
By now, I hope we all understand that drug addiction is not a choice and just not a moral failing. It is a disease. Instead of meeting the public health crisis of addiction with care and compassion, we've met it with punishment and penalties. The results have been devastating. And when it comes to crack cocaine, we established a sentencing disparity that has directly fueled the crisis of mass incarceration in America. During the first four decades of the war on drugs, our federal prison population grew by 700%, and the cost of operating federal prisons exploded by 1,100%. Those bloated costs have diverted public safety resources away from where they're needed and have made us less safe. Today, our nation is home to just 4% of the world's population and about 20% of the world's prisoners. In America, we pride ourselves as the land of the free, but the sad fact is we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Worse yet, the crack powder disparity has exacerbated, exacerbated the systemic racial inequities in our criminal justice system. We must bring this injustice to an end, and we can begin by eliminating the crack powder disparity. I'm confident we can achieve this on a bipartisan basis. Over the years, I've worked with my Republican colleagues like Ranking Member Grassley and even former Attorney General Sessions to reduce the crack powder disparity. In 2009, I authored the Fair Sentencing Act. The bill I wrote would have fully eliminated the crack powder disparity. But to get it across the finish line, I agreed to a compromise version with then Sen Senator Jeff Sessions that reduced the disparity from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. It was a good step forward, but not enough. This lingering disparity means that a person arrested for 28 grams of crack, do we have that? I guess we don't have the illustration, I'll skip that. As I've said, I'm confident we can come together to finally resolve this injustice because there are other steps we have taken to address inequities in our criminal justice system on an overwhelmingly bipartisan basis like the First Step Act. With that legislation, Republicans and Democrats with President Trump work together to improve conditions in our nation's prisons and shorten mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. We made Fair Sentencing Act retroactive, allowing thousands of people sentenced under the old 100 to 1 disparity to petition for early release, including Matthew Charles, who will speak to us today. Early evidence suggests that retroactive application of the Fair Sentencing Act has worked as intended. Last year, the Department of Justice reported that the recidivism rate for those released under the First Step Act was actually lower than historic recidivism rates. This much is clear. Our past efforts of reform have been bipartisan and they're working. The task that now lies before us is finishing the job we've started by eliminating, the, eliminating this disparity altogether. It has no basis in science. It's done nothing to make us safer. It serves only to undermine trust in our system of justice especially among black Americans who are six times, six times more likely to be imprisoned on drug charges than white Americans, even though the drug use is at a similar rate between them. What's more, legal experts and political leaders of all stripes agree, Congress needs to finish this job. When I chaired a subcommittee hearing on this issue in 2009, the Department of Justice testified in support of completely eliminating the disparity. Today, 12 years later, the Department of Justice again is calling for Congress to eliminate it in written testimony. I welcome the Republican Governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson, who testified at our 2009 hearing, again with us today, calling for, calling for Congress to pass the Equal Act. Thank you, Governor. Before I hand things off to Ranking Member Grassley, I want to tell a story that is important and very personal. Ranking Member Grassley has been an invaluable and trusted partner in this effort. I know that he feels, as I do, that there are thousands of people who should be seeing justice in this country who are not because of these guidelines. One person I will never forget is a woman, Eugenia Jennings. She was originally from Alton, Illinois. As a child, she was abandoned and seriously abused. At the age of 15, she started using crack to dull the pain of the, her life. At 23, she was convicted for trading a small amount of crack for clothing for her kids. The federal judge, a personal friend of mine, Patrick Murphy, delivered her sentence and he said, quote, this is not a sentence I'm happy with. I'm not proud of it. 
Congress has determined that the best way to handle people who are troublesome is just lock them up. So Eugenia Jennings, at the age of 23, was sentenced to 22 years in a federal prison for a nonviolent offense. She never gave up hope. While serving her time, she was a model prisoner who did everything asked of her. Years into her sentence, she developed a rare and serious form of cancer, leukemia. I'll never forget the day that I personally met her in the federal prison in Greenville, Illinois. I sat down with this lady and talked for over an hour. At the end of it, she said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to live, Senator, but I promise you this. If you can find some way to get me out of this prison to be with my girls, I'll never do anything wrong again in my life. So I sat down and wrote a personal note to a former senator from Illinois named Barack Obama and asked him to commute Eugenia's sentence. He did. And just in time for Eugenia to see her eldest daughter graduate from high school, she died less than two years later at the age of 36. As we approach the end of the graduation season this month, I'd like us all to think about Eugenia. When she entered prison, her daughter was six years old. The next time she saw her in the outside world, her daughter was a young woman. Eugenia missed her daughter's first day of high school, her prom, and so many other rites of passage. And I want to salute her brother, Cedric Parker, who was on the video, the earlier video. He raised those kids while Eugenia was in prison. But Eugenia missed them because the mythology surrounding crack cocaine still dictates federal policy. Eugenia's gone, but there's still so many people like her counting us to finally eliminate this disparity. Let's not wait another day. Now I recognize Ranking Member Grassley for his opening statement. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And before I begin my statement, just a uh, uh, comment, no disagreement with the statistics you use in regard to 4% of our population and 20% of uh, our imprisonment is greater than any other society. I, uh, just a question that I don't expect you to answer, and maybe there's no answer to it, but do those uh, figures include the Uyghurs, uh, millions of Uyghurs that the Chinese have in prison in their concentration camps? That's I'd a like good to, point. I'd like to have, see if we could find an answer to that. Drug sentencing laws are complex. They must be fair and they must be just. But prioritizing public safety is very important. As such, they can't be based only on violent crime, risk, prevention efforts, or racial justice concerns. They must be comprehensive. This is particularly true as we evaluate today's topic, sentencing laws on crack and powder cocaine. I've been a partner on this issue in the past. You've uh, recognized that today, and I appreciate that. I've indicated my openness to reevaluating the sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine, but I do have some questions about how to best do this. There are discrepancies between crack and powder cocaine in terms of recidivism rates, addiction, and violent crime. These factors can't be ignored. I'm hopeful today's testimony will touch on these aspects, but I believe a comprehensive consensus hearing on cocaine certainly would have highlighted these uh, nuanced points. I asked Chairman Durbin for a comprehensive hearing on cocaine so that we can have a complete understanding of all these issues. I wanted a consensus hearing, meaning that everything was agreed upon and that there were no minority or majority witnesses. Uh, but that's uh, not how this hearing unfolded. Today's hearing isn't consensus, nor is it as comprehensive as it should be. Instead, this hearing is focused only on sentencing issues, particularly in de deference to the Equal Act, and I have told people that I'm willing to look at uh, some sort of reduction in the disparity that exists today. I'm disappointed that my request for a comprehensive hearing on cocaine was dismissed, particularly since I've supported efforts to review crack 
and powder cocaine sentencing issues in the past. I co-sponsored the Fair Sentencing Act, which changed the 101 to 1 sentencing ratio for crack and powder cocaine to where it is today, 18 to 1. I supported this change of being made retroactive in the First Step Act. I joined an amicus brief submitted to the Supreme Court to review the ap ap after applicability of this provision, and I co-sponsored the First Step Implementation Act, which further allows for retroactive review and application of cocaine sentencing. We've accomplished a lot in this area already, and maybe there's more that can be done, and I've already indicated my willingness to talk about those things. So today's hearing is likely the first of many steps on cocaine sentencing because there's still a lot that we need to know. Today's government panel, for instance, shines a light on the vacuum of information Congress is operating in. The Department of Justice submitted a statement for the record in support of the Equal Act. The Biden Justice Department support for this bill isn't surprising. It's the same position as the Obama administration. But nobody from the Justice Department is here to testify. DOJ's absence makes it hard to fully evaluate and understand the scope and impact of changing the law. And while the United States Sentencing Commission has released excellent reports on federal drug sentencing laws, its most recent comprehensive report on cocaine sentencing was as far back as 2007. Also, the last time the Sentencing Commission testified before the Senate on this issue was way back 2009. At that time, they stated the sentencing ratio of crack and powder cocaine shouldn't be higher than 20 to 1. It's currently at 18 to 1. So, where does all this leave us now? I'm worried we're barreling down legislation without a complete picture of the issue or the necessary government witnesses before us today. I'm nonetheless looking forward to hearing this hearing, learning as much as I can, and discussing steps forward. And I'd like to be involved in those steps forward. I hope the future of this discussion will highlight a variety of perspectives and be more collaborative as we seek to find a solution together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Um, our work together is um, a body of work which I'm most proud of, and I want to continue it. And though we may have had a disagreement about the elements and the procedures today, uh, there's no fundamental disagreement between us, and I look forward to working with you to have a complete hearing on all the important issues that face us. I'll now turn to Senator Booker, the chair of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Criminal Justice and Counterterrorism, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak for a brief uh, time at the top of this hearing. I would like to submit my formal um, opening remarks for the record. I, I, I want to share with my colleagues um, you know, there's guiding principles to this country where we aspire to the highest ideals of humanity. Um, it's what our Constitution is based upon by our, our founding fathers who sought to make our, our nation uh, one that best evidenced uh, the ideals not just of humanity but of divine providence. There is a, uh, from the Abrahamic faiths, there's an ideal come from Micah, what do you want, O Lord, from your people, which is to do justice, um, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. This is one of those areas of law uh, where we have created this disparity that to me violate those highest ideals in a way that um, I can't identify as great as this in other areas. Um, I have had the privilege in my life of living in different types of communities. I lived and grew up in a wealthy community where my family was the only black family there. In communities of wealth and privilege, I, I saw drug use and know lots of people who were uh, uh, violating our laws. Uh, I've lived for the last 20 years in a low-income black and brown community, and I see the same human frailties. But the consequences for those uh, lawbreakers is very different. 
And when it comes to crack and powder cocaine, it has been stunning to me to see how this law has so terribly impacted the lives of folks, many of whom who need help, many of them who need treatment, uh, but devastated their lives with this disproportionate sentencing. I am trying to live up to those ideals of humility. I've listened very closely to all of the arguments that have been against changing this, and I've been uh, quite satisfied by the data, and I would appreciate uh, Chairman Grassley uh, talking about the concerns, because both sides of the aisle share the same concern, public safety, public safety. All the data that I can find that from objective sources gives no credence or validity to some of the concerns that I hear most often. For example, in 2014, the Sentencing Commission, looking at the re re retroactive reduction in crack cocaine guidelines, found that retroactive sentence reductions did not result in higher recidivism rates. The data is very clear. I've heard concerns expressed about violent crime, that somehow crack cocaine users, unlike powdered cocaine users, and again, there's dramatic racial disparities, that somehow those crack cocaine users were more likely to be engaged in violent crime. So I looked with humility towards the validity of those arguments. And objective sources say time and time again, that is not the case. Again, recent data dispels this notion that crack offenses account for a higher rate of weapons possession than powder cocaine, according to the data from the USSC, in fiscal year 2020, more federal offenders charged with powder cocaine offenses carried weapons, 490, than those charged with crack cocaine offenses, 468. In fact, it's the opposite. The data shows that powder cocaine folks are more likely to have weapons. And so for me, there is no substantive reason from the actual chemical, they're the same substance, all the way to the allegations that somehow the, the, this will lead to more violence or lead to more recidivism. This is just not the case. What is the case is that this has created within our society deeper schisms along racial lines where certain people have had their lives devastated by this disparity. This is not justice. This is not those high ideals of humanity that we talk about in our most sacred civic documents, like the ideals of equal justice under the law. I am so encouraged that this is a bipartisan effort, that there are numerous Republicans in the House and Senator Portman here that are working with us in a bipartisan way to end this stain of injustice in our community. I am so happy that the very people who are out there enforcing our laws from law enforcement organizations, national, national district attorneys, uh, the Americans for Prosperity, the Due Process Institute, Freedom Works, law enforcement leader after law enforcement leader are working together from right on crime to the very sentencing project are working together to end what is a shameful chapter in our country. You had Richard Nixon up there. And all of us are mountain ranges. I do not vilify anyone. We have all made good contributions and, and, and tough contributions. But, you know, I want to end with these words by, uh, by Ehrlichman that really were at the beginnings of the war on drugs, that, that sought to prey upon our prejudices to somehow deal with black communities different than others. Ehrlichman, later in his life, admitted that so much of the source of fear of black people was a political strategy. We knew, he says, quoting him, that we couldn't make it illegal to be either uh, against the war or being black. But he says that these were the two groups that were most likely to be against them. But by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt these communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. 
I live in a community now that for a generation has been vilified. That on the evening news, we made people afraid where words like super predators and others were heaped upon black communities and we have been devastated in this country as a result of the disproportion and incarceration of African Americans, even though there's no difference, no difference in America in the usage of drug rates along racial lines. We need to end this nightmare. It is not just hurting African American communities, it is a stain upon our highest ideals of humanity. We must, as a Senate, do as Micah commands, do justice, show mercy, and walk humbly with our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. Uh, Senator Cotton, as ranking member of the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, will be given an opportunity to submit opening remarks. Uh, in the meantime, we will return to uh, our witnesses and our first panel. We welcome two distinguished witnesses to testify about the continued disparities. Our first witness is Regina LaBelle, the Acting Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Director LaBelle is also a distinguished scholar and program director of the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at Georgetown Law's O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. Our second witness is Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, whom I welcome back. Governor Hutchinson has served in his current role since 2015 as governor. We see him every Sunday morning on the news. Previously, he served as a U.S. attorney, a U.S. congressman, and director of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency. Uh, I'll lay out the mechanics of today's hearing after we swear in the witnesses on the first pan panel. Each witness will have five minutes for opening statements, then rounds of questions from the senators, five minutes each. Ask them to pr please stick close to five minutes if you can. Following that, we'll switch to our second panel, uh, and Chairman Booker, depending on the votes on the floor and such, may take over that uh, responsibility uh, with five-minute opening statements and five minutes of questions from each. So I'd ask if the witnesses on the first panel would please stand to be sworn. If you'll raise your right hand, do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee? It will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Director LaBelle, please proceed. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, Committee Members, thank you for inviting me to testify on the important issue of eliminating the sentencing disparity that remains between sentences for people charged with trafficking of crack versus powder cocaine. The Biden-Harris administration strongly supports eliminating the current disparity in sentencing between crack and powder cocaine. The current disparity is not based on evidence, yet has caused significant harm for decades, particularly for individuals, families, and communities of color. The continuation of the sentencing disparity is a significant injustice in our legal system, and it's past time for it to end. Therefore, the administration urges the swift passage of the Eliminating a Quantifiably Unjust Application of the Law Act, or the Equal Act. The Biden-Harris administration is taking an evidence-based approach to drug policy and eliminating this disparity is in alignment with that approach. I'd like to highlight some of the significant evidence to support this position. First, the sentencing disparity is not based on sound scientific evidence. We currently have a system under which the same offense, distribution of cocaine, results in radically different sentences depending on the form of cocaine, even though both formulations affect the brain in the same way. Research suggests that the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity under the Anti-Drug Abuse Act did not result in decreased crack cocaine use. Similarly, the reduction of the mandatory sentencing disparity to 18 to 1 under the Fair Sentencing Act was not associated with an increase in crack cocaine use. However, data published by the United States Sentencing Commission has shown that a higher percentage of black Americans are convicted in federal court for crack cocaine offenses versus powder cocaine offenses and this sentencing disparity has caused them to receive substantially longer average sentence lengths for comparable offenses. To put this in perspective, under the original 100 to 1 sentencing disparity, a five-year mandatory minimum penalty would be triggered by trafficking five grams of crack, whereas the same penalty would only be triggered if someone trafficked 500 grams of powder cocaine. And under the original law, simple possession of any amount of crack cocaine exceeding five grams incurred a five-year mandatory penalty but there was no corresponding mandatory penalty for powder cocaine possession. 
Under the original sentencing disparity on average, black Americans were incarcerated for nonviolent offenses for almost the same length of time as white Americans who committed violent offenses. In 2010, Congress took the important step to reduce this disparity to 18 to 1. However, in the past two fiscal years, black Americans accounted for 81% and 77% of all federal crack cocaine convictions, retro respectively. Because of the disparity, these convictions led to prison time far longer than they would have been for equivalent amounts of powder cocaine. The sentencing disparity is part of a larger system with separate and equal tracks for people of color and white people in the United States who use drugs or have a substance use disorder. In 2018, the rate of incarceration for Hispanics was three times that of white Americans, and the incarceration rate for black Americans was 5.6 times that of white Americans. And these racial inequities are not limited to criminal justice. When looking at access to substance use treatment, a recent study showed that black individuals generally enter treatment four to five years later than white individuals, even when controlling for socioeconomic status. And in Hispanic communities, those who need treatment for substance use disorder are less likely to access care than non-Hispanics. We know that substance use disorders can become chronic conditions over time. And years spent without treatment and in incarcerated settings can both exacerbate substance use disorder and lead to other societal issues. President Biden has emphasized the need to ra address racial inequities in the criminal justice system. For example, he's been clear people should not be incarcerated for drug use alone, but should instead be offered treatment. As a senator in 2007, he introduced legislation to eliminate the sentencing disparity entirely, and it's long past time to do this. ONDCP's charge has always been to reduce drug use and its consequences, and for far too long our nation's approach to addressing substance use has led to disproportionate consequences for communities of color. If we follow the evidence and advance equity, as President Biden has directed our agency to do, we need to eliminate the sentencing disparity. In closing, the Biden-Harris administration supports the Equal Act in a complete elimination of the unfair sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. Based on, this was based on inaccurate and unsound assumptions and has caused disproportionate harm to our most vulnerable communities. Thank you for your time and thank you for holding this important hearing that we hope will lead to real change. Thank you very much. Governor Hutchison. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, for your comments today, Ranking Member Grassley and members of the committee. Uh, in 2009, I appeared before this committee, as was noted by the chairman, and I appeared here on the same subject, expressing my support for reducing or eliminating the disparity of sentencing between crack and powder cocaine cases. As a result of the work of this committee, in 2010, the sentencing disparity was reduced down to 18 to 1, but as noted, the work is not yet finished. And I'm honored to be back today to express my continued support for eliminating uh, that disparity and creating greater sense of fairness in our criminal justice system. As uh, noted, uh, I've served uh, this country in a variety of law enforcement positions, from a federal prosecutor to administrator of the DEA. And now as governor, I continue to be concerned about First of all, reducing illegal drug use and reducing the supply, but also very concerned about fairness in our criminal justice system. From my state perspective, and let me just take a moment, the presence of crack and powder cocaine is down in Arkansas. Arkansas is part of the Gulf Coast Haida, high in intensity drug trafficking area, and the latest drug assessment is that cocaine is ranked as the fifth greatest drug threat and is considered a moderate threat within the Gulf Coast uh, Hyder region. If you look at the statistics, we've had uh, total pounds of cocaine seized decrease by 42 percent from 2019 to 2020. That's a nationwide statistic. Arkansas has adopted, or at least uh, we have, in place the one-to-one -one ratio for crack versus powder cocaine uh, in our state. Uh, I believe that is the right uh, standard that should be set, and let me summarize the need for eliminating the sentencing disparity. First of all, as been noted by 
uh, our director of ONDCP, the substances are chemically the same, and therefore they should be treated the same for sentencing purposes. It's a fundamental principle. Secondly, as noted by Senator Booker and others, there's a disproportionate harm to communities of color. The Sentencing Commission data shows that in 2019, 81 percent of crack cocaine defendants were black. In the 2020, it was 76 percent of crack cocaine defendants were black. Obviously, uh, whenever you sentence them to a higher level of punishment, that is a disproportionate um, uh, impact on African Americans. Uh, and what's interesting is that the SAMHSA uh, data shows that crack cocaine users are predominantly white. And so uh, that adds to the sense of unfairness uh, in our criminal justice system. And that leads to the third reason, which is fundamental, and that is that the sentencing disparity is unfair. Just as importantly, it is perceived as unfair and undermines confidence in our criminal justice system in which all those in law enforcement uh, understands how critical a sense of fairness is to achieving cooperation, uh, respect, and to reinforce the rule of law. Unfairness erodes cooperation, whether it's the development of informants, to the ability to get cooperation, to the working up the ladder of a drug trafficking organizations. Confidence in equal treatment under the law is the foundation of our rule of law, and it is currently being undermined by that disparity. And I know it's been addressed that there is more violence associated with crack cocaine, and there might be some disagreement on the statistics there. But however you conclude that topic, uh, we have to recognize that the sentencing guidelines has factors that will recognize the degree of, of uh, firearm use, whether victims that have been harmed, and the criminal record of the defendant. All of those are factors that can be brought to bear on the ultimate sentence versus using a much more unreliable indicator for length of sentence, which would be the quantity. And so the sentencing guidelines have plenty of leeway to account for violent crime might be associated uh, with crack cocaine use versus simply utilizing quantity as a chief indicator. With that, I'm very honored to be here before uh, many colleagues that I respect and this committee and the work of it, and I look forward to the question time. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Acting Director LaBelle, from a scientific perspective. Is there any rational justification for reducing the sentencing disparity? Uh, well, the, there, the scientific basis of uh, both base cocaine, which is crack cocaine, and, um, and powder cocaine, they're similar and they have similar effects on the brain. The issue is how uh, the drug is used. That's been, that's been the issue in the past. Uh, but really, the, the, the drugs themselves, uh, the form of the drug is uh, essentially the same. I don't know if this illustration will be effective or not. First, this is flour, and this is an indication of the amount of powder cocaine that would result in the sentencing for this weighted amount of crack cocaine, 100 to 1. Uh, 18 to 1, I'm sorry, 18 to 1, which uh, is an indication that if there's no science between the difference, the sentencing is dramatically different. Uh, I think that is the simple, direct point we're trying to make at this hearing. Governor Hutchinson, you have seen this war on drugs from so many angles. I, I, I can't think of a person who has the kind of experience you do. U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Arkansas, member of the House, Administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Under Secretary for Border and Transportation Security, and now Governor of Arkansas. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate your candor uh, about the impact that this has on respect for the law in some communities. When African Americans disproportionately are penalized for this sentencing disparity, what it must mean to the community 
Have you seen this firsthand as governor of your state or in your previous assignments? Uh, I have seen it uh, in really all of the assignments that uh, you recited. Uh, and there's probably no one that supports our law enforcement uh, uh, more than me. I've been a part of it. I believe in them. I want to encourage them. And uh, in each of the roles that I've seen, uh, unfairness undermines the respect for the law, and that is so important to our law enforcement officers. From a personal perspective, it's been different as governor because I've seen clemency and pardon applications come across my desk in which uh, I've seen the unfairness play out in the criminal justice system. And even though we have a one-to-one -one ratio here in Arkansas, you still see uh, the consequences of severe penalties uh, for uh, simple possession, multiple possessions of, of drugs. And so you see the heartache and you want to do everything you can to eliminate unfairness so that will gain respect both for law enforcement and for the system. And I think that's what I tried to allude to in my opening remarks. The personal and family devastation of long sentences. And what it, I'm amazed that any uh, of these prisoners can come back, and I've seen so many of them come back after serving long periods of time uh, to rebuild their families and rebuild their lives, but it is devastating. And I just want to add one other element to here. This sentencing disparity is not a creation of law enforcement. It is a creation of legislators, congressmen, senators, who have come up with these laws on sentencing disparities. So it is no reflection on law enforcement. It's our reflection on us and what we have done in establishing these standards of sentencing. And I think that's why we have such an awesome responsibility. I can't thank you both enough for being here today, your testimony. Senator Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to start out with uh, Director LaBelle. According to the Inst Institute of Drug Abuse, treatment for stimulant addiction, including cocaine abuse, is an under-researched area. Unlike treating opioid abuse, there aren't any approved medications to treat cocaine addiction. Also, the majority of those seeking treatment for cocaine smoke crack and are likely to be polydrug users. Our federal drug sentencing laws should avoid creating more victims and, addict and addicts in vulnerable communities. However, if we end up legislating on crack and powder cocaine sentencing, we should all be in agreement that deterring drug trafficking is vitally important. First, do you agree? And second, would, you, would more research in cocaine dosage amounts, treatment options, prevention tactics, and addictiveness of cocaine be helpful? Thank you, Senator, for that important question. So I came here from uh, the Interdiction Committee. Um, so ONDCP, as you know, has a wide uh, array of authorities, including drug interdiction. And so we are looking very closely at the efforts that need to be taken to reduce drug trafficking coming into the United States and then inside the United States. Uh, so certainly we uh, agree and appreciate the, it's one of our policy priorities is reducing the supply of drugs coming into the country and then drug trafficking in, in, in the country. Secondly, on your piece, uh, we totally agree that we need a whole of government approach and to look at the continuum of care for people with substance use disorder. Um, preventing, preventing substance use disorders and substance use from ever occurring is an essential part of our strategy, just as treatment is an essential part of our strategy. As you said, there is no medication for um, cocaine use disorder, but that doesn't mean there aren't effective treatments. We're looking at the barriers that exist to one of the most effective forms of treatment uh, for cocaine use disorder. Uh, those are things that we appreciate Congress's um, uh, investments, significant investments, through the American Rescue Plan and through uh, the President's um, uh, budget that's been sent to the Hill. There's $10 billion to be spent on addressing 
addressing the demand side of the equation, and then also we support uh, money and investments on the supply side. Thank you. Uh, your agency is tasked with making and coordinating our nationwide drug control strategy. Your office released a statement of drug policy priorities earlier this year. It mentioned that we must reduce the supply of illicit drugs. I think an effective way to stop the supply of deadly drugs is to have an effective and consistent drug control laws on the books. This is true for all controlled substances. I'm confused why your statement on drug policy priorities didn't outline a permanently how permanently scheduling fentanyl analogs would be essential to reduce their supplies. Do you think permanently scheduling fentanyl-related substances in the United States would reduce the supply of these illicit drugs? So you've pointed out an incredibly important issue, which is the uh, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in the United States. And we know that of the uh, 90,000 overdose deaths from last year, from 2020, that 75 percent of them involved in uh, a fentanyl or a fentanyl analog. Uh, so what we're doing is working with the interagency to make sure that we can present to, um, to Congress uh, a solution on the, the permanent scheduling or scheduling of fentanyl analogs. So we're working with DOJ, DEA, uh, and our partners at HHS to send something to the Hill by the fall. Are you working with members of Congress to do that? Because I'm committed to working uh, with anybody that wants to work with on this issue and working in a bipartisan way with Congress to make sure fentanyl-related substances are permanently scheduled would be very helpful. Are you? Uh, doing that. Certainly, sir. We are, we are, I know that my staff has met with your staff. We just sent a letter and we're happy to have ongoing conversations. Yeah. Uh, quickly, I'm not going to give a lead into this question because I don't have time. Can you agree with me that these kinds of considerations are critical to review along with racial justice concerns? And how can we ensure these factors are considered when reviewing drug sentencing laws? Now I realize I couldn't leave out the lead in. I mentioned in my opening remarks how there are many factors that must be considered when reviewing sentencing laws of crack and powder cocaine. This includes recidivism data, violent crime, addictiveness, and racial issues. According to the Sentencing Commission, crack offenders receive, uh, receive a weapons sentencing enhancement more often than powder traffickers. Also, of all tr drug trafficking offenders, crack cocaine dealers recidivate at a highest rate. So do I need to repeat my question? Um, so I think the, the main issue that you've raised is one of um, that when people leave incarceration, uh, they often recidivate. And one of the reasons that happens is because when people are incarcerated, they may not get the treatment that they need for their substance use disorder. And that substance use disorder doesn't go away simply because they were incarcerated. So if someone has a cocaine use disorder, when they're incarcerated, they should be receiving treatment for that cocaine use disorder so that when they leave, they won't recidivate. Um, so I think that's one of the issues that ONDCP is taking on in our policy priorities and working on our drug strategy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Feinstein. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor Hutchinson, as the former head of DEA under President Bush, the first undersecretary for border and transportation security at DHS, and a former U.S. attorney, your law enforcement credentials speak for themselves. Yet you have repeatedly and publicly advocated for the elimination of the sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. I'm not being critical, but I think your views are really important in this discussion because you have this extensive background in law enforcement and you have a career in public service. So what led you to speak out so much and so eloquently on this issue? Well, thank you, Senator Feinstein. And uh, being personally aware of unfairness uh, should call us all to speak out, just as members of this committee has. And, you know, in the 80s, when uh, President Reagan uh, 
we started the really the tough side of the fight against drugs, which was uh, we our uh, targets. Uh, you know, whenever we had our asset seizures, all of those things toughened our fight against illegal drugs. And it really wasn't until I got to Congress that working with some of the my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee that I saw how the application of those. Uh, uh, the disparate uh, sentencing laws impacted our community and the respect for our law. And so, are, are you referring out. to the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity? Yes, I'm referring to the 100, 100 to 1 sentencing disparity was unconscionable in my view. It was not based upon good science. It ought to be changed because it was unfair. So now we're 35 years later, and do you believe that um, our understanding? of the situation is better? I, I do. I, I, we understand the science better. We understand the impact. Uh, we understand uh, the unfairness of it. It's supported by statistics. And we also, you know, have a good sentencing grid that can address the other issues of violence uh, associated with crime. So we do understand it better, and that should lead us to take the final step to eliminate completely that disparity. Well, thank you very much. I think that's very powerful testimony. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Feinstein. Senator Cornyn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. LaBelle, um, we've read, I've read over the Biden administration's statement of drug policy priorities for year one, and, um, and I appreciate your testimony about the, the importance of follow-on services for people who are released from incarceration so that they don't uh, repeat their mistakes. And uh, to that end, Senator Whitehouse and I recently introduced a bill called the Residential Substance Use Disorder Treatment Act of 2021, which would expand the use of substance, um, would expand access to substance use treatments in jails and prisons. So. Um, certainly with you on that and uh, want to continue to uh, support those efforts. In, in my state, in Texas, part of what, what we did on prison reform is help give people access to programs when they're in prison and hope they don't recidivate once they get out, but it really required follow-on services. We can't just expect that we're going to let somebody out of prison and then they're not going to go back in the same old neighborhood and be ex exposed to the same old, uh, same old temptations, perhaps and the same old associates. But other than supporting the high-density drug trafficking areas program and attempting to work with commercial carriers to intercept synthetic drugs being moved through postal and parcel systems, what do you intend to do in your office to uh, improve domestic drug enforcement? Thank you, Senator, for that question. So um, ONDCP, as you said, has, um, has many aspects to it. What we try to do is, um, is look at source countries, so Colombia, Mexico, et cetera, uh, and, and that's the first step. Keep the drugs from coming into the United States. And as you asked about domestic uh, work, we have the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, uh, and they work uh, extensively with uh, their state and local partners uh, to disrupt drug trafficking. And so a lot of our work is really focused on, on, on working with the HIDAs, having partnerships with the Drug Enforcement Administration, and making sure that all the pieces are in place to support law enforcement, first of all, to divert people away from the criminal justice system to support law enforcement to disrupt drug trafficking networks. And then lastly, for people who are involved in criminal justice, as you said, making sure they get the supports they need both while they're incarcerated and upon reentry. Do you, do you recall how many Americans died of drug overdoses in the last year? Certainly, sir. There are 92,000. That's um, as of October 2020. And do you agree with me that a lot of those drugs come across our southwestern border? Um, so the, what we know is that 75 percent of the 92,000 overdose deaths involved fentanyl. Uh, and fentanyl na right now, the most of the fentanyl is coming from uh, Mexico. And 90 percent of the heroin that comes to this country comes from Mexico too. Is that, do you agree with that figure? Uh, I believe that's the current figure. Okay. So we ought to all be concerned, should we not? Uh, shouldn't the Biden administration be concerned about the overwhelming flood of people coming at the border, including unaccompanied children and diverting their border patrol from uh, their law enforcement uh, 
uh, function to taking care of these unaccompanied children? Shouldn't that be a matter of concern? So what ONDCP is doing, and, and yesterday actually I met with the Mexican ambassador to the United States, uh, is talking to them about their ports, about the fentanyl coming in to their country, to again, to keep it from even getting to the border. Uh, so disrupting labs in, uh, in Mexico, and so those are many of the, the high-level dialogues that we're having with Mexican officials. So you know, do you know how much of uh, Mexico is controlled by the cartels as opposed to the government? It's, a, it's a significant. Sir. Right. It is significant. It's uh, frightening, in fact. Um, and you didn't answer my question about diverting Border Patrol, but uh, we'll move on to something else. Governor Hutchison, uh, I have a lot of respect for your public service, and certainly I've followed it and worked with you um, off and on over the years. I'm trying to figure out how this disparity issue would apply in other contexts, not just to cocaine, um, crack versus powder. Because if you had the little bags of flour that Senator Durbin had that he showed with the 18 to 1 disparity, and you had heroin in one, and you had fentanyl in another, there would be a, fentanyl is a whole lot more powerful, uh, as I understand it, than heroin. And I'm just wondering, across different types of opioids, let's say, for example, prescription drugs, heroin, and fentanyl, do you think this same principle can be applied? And I'm just wondering how, how that would work. I think that's an excellent question, and I think there is a reason for a broader discussion about our sentencing policy in relation to drugs. Uh, they're ultimately set by Congress, and you have to look at the impact uh, you have to uh, look at the uh, chemical qualities of it. I think we've made determination based upon science as the similarity between crack and powder cocaine, but obviously there's distinctions between fentanyl, which deserves all of the uh, resources and uh, uh, investigation that's possible because of the harm that is being done. And so I think those are very good discussions. I do believe, as I said, that quantity is not always the best indicator. Uh, as to culpability and consequences and punishment. So it should be many more factors simply than quantity. Thanks, Senator Cornyn. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, and thank you for your long determination on this issue. It's much appreciated. Um, I want to just open by echoing uh, Governor Hutchinson's comment that the, many of the factors that have been used to argue for the sentencing disparity actually turn up separately in the sentencing guidelines. And so to the extent that there are dangers associated with certain episodes of crack cocaine dealing, the sentencing guidelines are capable of taking that up and a judge is capable of ruling on that. So I thought that was a, a very important point, and it's something that I certainly saw in my time as U.S. Attorney. So um, thank you, Governor, for that. Uh, Ms. LaBelle, I want to double down on uh, my friend Senator Cornyn's reference to our residential substance use disorder treatment bill. Um, I hope we can get strong support from the administration for that. As you have said, it's really important to pick people up while they're incarcerated, well before they're discharged and to make sure that once they're discharged, that treatment continues and that there's follow through through that entire process. We've seen in Rhode Island, when you do that, that um, it improves recidivism. And it also dramatically uh, reduced opioid overdose fatalities in the immediate aftermath of discharge. So it's a lifesaver in addition to being the right way to handle this condition. And I appreciate your recognition of that, and I'd love to work with you to make sure this bill gets strong support from the administration. And I would say the same about the um, CARA 3.0 measure. Um, as you know, Senator Portman and I wrote CARA many years ago, and it passed with huge bipartisan support here in the Senate and passed through Congress and was signed into law, and then we got large chunks of our CARA 2.0 bill put into uh, another measure, and now we're working on CARA 3.0, which provides the kind of 
comprehensive approach to combating substance use disorder, use disorder that um, the General Assembly of the United Nations has recommended when they said evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery options to drug users engaging those who commit criminal offenses in evidence-based treatment during and following or in lieu of incarceration to prevent relapse and recidivism. And we look forward to working with you and hope you'll support both of those efforts. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. I'd She's like welcome to, to say whether she'll support oh. either of those efforts. Ms. LaBelle. Um, so, Senator, I wanted to um, point out when you talk about the, the importance of uh, the RSAP program and what happened in Rhode Island, um, I think this is really significant that it's a, you had a 60% a decrease in overdose deaths among people who had just left incarceration and a 6% de decrease statewide. And what happened in Rhode Island really lit a fire around the country for more states to have treatment behind the walls. Um, and yes, we're happy to meet with you and, and talk to you about uh, all of this legislation that you mentioned, CARA and RSAP. Be sure to thank uh, your new Commerce Secretary, Governor Raimondo, because yeah. she played an important role in making sure that our uh, prison administration developed that and imposed it and enforced it and saw those really good results. Yes. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Uh, before I recognize Senator Lee, I would just, I'm glad Senator Cornyn is still here. Uh, in the FY 2019, Congress appropriated $570 million for U.S. Customs and Border Protection to deploy non intrusive inspection systems. I think that's maybe Z portals and perhaps some others along the southwest border. Technology allowing our border inspectors to x ray the contents of trucks, cars, buses, and cargo containers. CBP officials have informed Congress this additional funding be used to obtain technology to increase the scanning rate of commercial trucks to 72% and passenger vehicles to 40% by fiscal year 2024. We're still several years removed. But if I recall, this was approved and supported by the Trump administration to put in this technology, and we have been funding it. And uh, I thank you for raising that point. If, if I can just reply briefly, I think that's, that's good. That's a good thing. But you have to also recognize that a lot of illegal drugs come between the ports of entry in backpacks by mules who are carrying drugs for the cartels. And uh, we don't know how many people that our Border Patrol can actually encounter because you don't know the ones that you don't run into. You can pick up the ones that you do run into and have a hope of interdicting them. But right now, 40 percent of the Border Patrol are taken off the front lines uh, because they're taking care of unaccompanied children because of the current humanitarian crisis at the border. That leaves an opening, a huge opening for the cartels to run drugs through those gaps in Border Patrol coverage. So I think the technical means is, is helpful, but it certainly doesn't address the concern that I have about the fact the Biden administration doesn't appear to have any concerns whatsoever about the current crisis. Thank you. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. LaBelle, I'd like to start with you. Um, it, CBP saw a sharp increase in the number of, of total enforcement actions from fiscal year 2018 to 2019, with enforcement actions now uh, on track to almost double in fiscal year 2021. It, these include actions related to inadmissibles, to apprehensions and arrests along the border. During that same time, we've witnessed a 73 percent increase in the amount of cocaine seized at the border. Uh, would you agree that these numbers suggest that there's a huge increase in the amount of cocaine entering the United States from the southern border? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, and so we're not seeing, I mean, yes, we, we've seen some increase in cocaine, but over time, over the last couple of years, it's been relatively stable. What we're very concerned about is um, certainly increased cultivation numbers in Colombia, because I think what we have to do is make sure that it never reaches that stage. And the efforts that are being made uh, at the border, most of these come through the ports of entry, through vehicles, and that's where the scanning information, the scanning devices come through, certainly for fentanyl. Uh, and so what we're, we're seeing over the course of a couple of years is that it's relatively stable. But we have to look back at the interdiction, interdiction piece in Colombia, and cultivation numbers are up. What about the, the um, 
increase that we're seeing in fiscal year 2021. I isn't it possible that at least some of those are attributable to the open border policies of the current administration? Um, thank you for asking that question, Senator. I think that we, you know, see, uh, so flow doesn't always equate to seizures. Uh, some of that may be, have been because we had actually uh, earlier this year during COVID fewer people coming across the border. Again, you know, we work with CBP very closely to make sure that they have the support they need uh, to prevent uh, cocaine from coming into this country. And again, I want to go back to the interdiction work that we do, that the Coast Guard does, and the uh, work that we do with the country of Colombia to make sure that the, those drugs never even make it that far. Okay. Now, uh, let's uh, talk about the, um, this, the relationship between sentencing and um, uh, drug interdictions and drug activity. Uh, setting aside for a minute the disparity issue, just assume categorically that if, if we started sentencing cocaine generally less harshly, wouldn't that have some risk of increasing um, or, or in, at least incentivizing drug trafficking across our southern border? Um, so, um, Senator, I want to go back to um, what we're looking at right now is, I mean, is the disparity issue. And I think what we're talking about is that 18 to 1. I don't, we haven't seen an increase in crack cocaine use. And in fact, it's pretty, it's a tiny proportion of people uh, in this country who have substance use disorders who use crack. Uh, and for powder cocaine, it's about twice as much. Um, but really, we, we haven't seen the relation between sentencing guideline and use or even trafficking in the country. Given, uh, given the fact that we've got, um, I mean, let's, let's assume for, for sake of argument that these drugs should be treated the same way uh, uh, for sentencing purposes and that there shouldn't be this disparity. Um, this still does leave an outstanding issue that, uh, that I'm not sure the bill we're discussing today addresses. Given how dangerous that both crack cocaine and powder cocaine are, uh, and, and the, the current triple increase in the number of cocaine-associated deaths over the last decade, should we, why shouldn't we be concerned about raising the amount of crack cocaine needed in order to trigger the mandatory minimum rather than lowering the amount of powder cocaine? Do you understand my question? Um, I think so, but I, I want to, um, so cocaine overdose deaths are, uh, are up. However, what's up, what's causing that increase is the presence of fentanyl in people who have died. Uh, so it's not cocaine use solely. Cocaine use is actually uh, somewhat down. Yeah, but, the but they're still dying because they purchased and used cocaine. I mean, well, yes, it's tainted cocaine, and it's been cut with something that is very deadly. But these are still deaths. They are still cocaine overdose-related related deaths. There's another complicating factor. But I'm, uh, I'm not sure that negates the sentencing concern I'm talking about. In other words, my question is, do we need to be concerned about um, uh, you know, what's the appropriate level to set it? Yeah, I, I think there is widespread agreement on this committee that the disparity is difficult to defend. The question becomes, what do we do about the disparity? Do we, do we raise the threshold for one or, or reduce the threshold for the other? I think what the, the bill calls for and what the administration supports is reducing the crack cocaine threshold to make it even with cocaine, with powder cocaine. I don't think we're, we're requesting an increase. I don't think that's related to either cocaine use or overdose deaths. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Can I ask one follow-up question? To, uh, uh, Governor Hutchison, do you have any, any response to that question? Uh, do we raise one, lower the other? Do we meet in the middle? Uh, that's a... Great question, and the, my answer to that is, again, I think we're better off addressing the concerns of these substances in terms of increased penalties based upon uh, whether there's a firearm at the time, whether there's other violence or the victims and the, those, and, and the prior record. Those are things the sentencing judge can consider, and I think that's preferable. And with where we are right now, uh, I, I believe that the act as drip, uh, addressed and as drafted is a good remedy for it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Senator Coons? 
Um, thank you, Chairman Durbin, um, and thank you for your years of leadership on this important issue. Ranking Member Grassley, Senator Booker, um, I just want to thank uh, our witnesses for being here today as well and um, commend the leadership of those on this committee who are working hard to advance the Equal Act uh, and the Biden administration that is uh, calling on all of us uh, to apply evidence-based policy in a way that actually addresses uh, racial inequalities in criminal justice. Um, to Acting Director LaBelle, um, I've long worked closely with the ONDCP in my 10 years in local government and as a chair and ranking member of the FSGG Appropriations Subcommittee. Look forward to working with you more closely. I think it's a vital uh, office. I'm glad that it has survived unscathed the attempts to restructure it and realign it in recent years. And um, I um, had a great series of visits to Delaware of the previous director and hope that um, whoever is the next director uh, will commit to coming to Delaware to visit us as well. Um, I just would be interested in um, hearing from you why the crack cocaine sentencing disparity does more harm than good in our communities um, and what the Biden administration is calling on this body to do about it and then what the administration will be doing to address drug crime with a whole of government approach. Thank you, Senator, and um, thanks for your long time involvement with uh, ONDCP and support for the office. Um, so I think what, uh, what really we're uh, looking at today is to restore trust and faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and also for drug policy, uh, one of our policy priorities is to advance equity. That's a huge, huge undertaking. But this is one step we can take today after a number of years. Um, it, in our policy priorities, as we sent to the Hill, include, there are seven of them. One of them is racial equity. It also includes um, supply reduction, so reducing the supply of drugs uh, that are, um, are consumed in this country. And that's not only domestic law enforcement. That, as I've said, includes going to source countries. I mean, I would think that half of my time is spent on international issues. And so it's that whole of government approach that we need to address the issue. Well, um, I look forward to working more closely with you on that, both the transnational issues and the domestic issues. Uh, Governor, if I could, I just am so grateful um, for your voice and your leadership on this. This isn't a partisan issue. Um, and as uh, the acting director um, said, it, it's long overdue. Uh, my predecessor in this seat, then Senator Biden, back in 2007, introduced legislation to eliminate um, this disparity. Um, can you speak to how these disparities have uh, damaged communities and why you support rectifying it, and in particular, why the retroactive provisions of the Equal Act are important um, to make a difference to families and communities that have already been harmed by this long-standing sentencing disparity? 